Great, I think we're live. Hi everyone, um, and welcome to my DevSecOps. If you're the if you're here for the first time, we're an inclusive community that aims to educate and enable developers in application security. And today I'm joined by the lovely Liz Rice, who is the VP of Open Source Engineering and Container Security Specialist at Aqua Security. So hi Liz. Hello, thank you very much, Sam. And hi everyone. Amazing. So um, Liz will be talking about vulnerability scanning and container images. But before we get started with that, just want to introduce myself for anyone that doesn't know me. My name's Sam and I'm the community manager here. Um, I'll also be on the Slack channel if anyone's a member of that, feeding questions across to Liz. So please keep your, your opinion uh, questions in there. We can get them answered. Um, anything you'd like to see in terms of sessions, please feel free to tweet me, DM me on, on Slack or email me this community is definitely for you. I know most of us are currently on house arrest somewhere in the world. So I've um, got a bit more time on our hands. So please let me know if there's something you'd like to see in the next few weeks. Um, Slack's actually the best place to interact today. So if you're not a member, if you pop onto mydevsecops.io, you can find the link there. Join the Slack and we're currently all chatting on the live sessions channel. Um, you can also pop on that website to find all our previous sessions, rewatch Liz's session today, um, and obviously find all the contact details for us. Uh, um, My Ops is actually um, supported and brought to you by Sneak. Their aim is to create a vendor neutral community um, to share knowledge and best practice. So a huge thanks to them. Uh, but that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Liz. So Liz, thank you so much again for being here. Thank you so much and uh, hi everyone from your homes around the world. I'm just going to try and share my slides. This worked a second ago when we did a tech check. So I think that looks like it's good. There we go. Yeah, you're alive. Right. Excellent. Yeah, so uh, as Sam said, and thank you very much, Sam, for the, for the intro. Um, if you do have any questions, do throw them into that site channel. I, I really like interactive sessions and I, so I love your questions as we go along. It's great. Uh, yeah, so my name is Liz Rice. I work with a company called Aqua Security, where we help enterprises. We have a platform for securing their cloud native deployments. And one of the really important parts about securing your containerized, your cloud native deployment is to make sure you're not running containers that contain known vulnerabilities. So that's really what I'm going to concentrate on today. I'm going to talk a bit about um, what vulnerabilities are and a bit about how vulnerability scanners work and uh, why they're so important. And what I hope is that by the end of today's session, you'll all be, if you don't already have it, you will be adding image scanning into your CI CD pipelines, into your workflows, because uh, it's pretty easy to add and you get a big security benefit out of it. All right, so did I skip? Okay. Okay, so what am I talking about when I talk about vulnerabilities? This is all about flaws, bugs, some kind of issue within the code that an attacker can exploit and uh, cause something bad to happen potentially inside your system. Uh, you have heard of some of these vulnerabilities. Some of the really, really critical ones get so kind of famous, they get their own logos. So things like Meltdown, Shellshock, Heartbleed, and Dirty Cow. Uh, you've probably heard of them if you've uh, you know, had any kind of involvement in software uh, security. But these are really just you know, the tip of the iceberg. These are the kind of Beyonce's and Justin Bieber's of the uh, vulnerability world. There are thousands of less well-known and probably less critical uh, vulnerabilities that get discovered every year. Every one of these vulnerabilities gets given an identifier called a CVE number. So CVE stands for Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, and CVE have this lovely logo that I think 1994 is called and, and asked for it back, but it's still, that that's the logo. And so when a researcher finds a, a vulnerability in a piece of software, they uh, basically register that vulnerability and it gets this unique identifier. And uh, you get information about that vulnerability stored in 
a list called the National Vulnerability Database. So you might hear the terms CVE and NVD in the context of software vulnerabilities. And the NVD lists, uh, has an entry for each of these uh, vulnerabilities, each of these CVEs, and the entry will tell you basically what is this, this exploit, what, what's it all about, and what software packages does it affect. So here's an example of a sort of extract for, this is for the Heartbleed vulnerability, and it's telling us that this particular vulnerability will affect you if you're using the OpenSSL package and all of these different versions, basically 101 all the way through to 102 beta one. So all of those versions were affected. If you're running with this version of OpenSSL, you are in some danger because you've got this heart bleed exploit and uh, an attacker could potentially take adv advantage of that vulnerability in your system. So we use vulnerability scanners to try to establish whether or not these vulnerabilities exist in, in our system so that we can do something about it. We can, we can address those vulnerabilities. There are lots of different types of vulnerability scanners. Um, that term includes things like port scanning, um, but really what I'm gonna talk about today, I'm just gonna focus on looking for known vulnerabilities, ones with CVE identifiers, in software packages installed in container images. I said known vulnerabilities, and those are the ones that have these CVE identifiers assigned to them. Of course, there could also be unknown vulnerabilities by which that you know they haven't been uh, published. There is no CVE. Um, maybe those are flaws in your own application code as a. a an enterprise operating application code, you could have your own unique set of software bugs in your unique software, and maybe those flaws could be taken advantage of by an attacker. Those are essentially unknown to any uh, vulnerability scanner, so or at least of the scanners that I'm talking about today. Um, it's the known ones we're really interested in. But of course, the known ones are the ones that attackers know about too. So they're the ones that scripts, you know, on the internet are constantly trying to uh, take advantage of. So these known vulnerabilities, it's basically, uh, you can have a scanner that will identify whether or not you're running with these packages that contain known vulnerabilities. Uh, there are also tools for looking for these unknown vulnerabilities, so things like fuzzers, uh, OWASP tools here, they're, they're designed to look for these unknown vulnerabilities or to, to attempt to do the kind of things that maybe uh, might be permitted because of an unknown vulnerability. The known ones are specifically looking for known vulnerable packages. There's a handful of different ones I've listed there. There's, there. There are many more vulnerability scanners out there. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the kind of things you might want to look for in, uh, in different vulnerability scanners. Some of them are open source, some of them are commercial. The, the choice is yours. So really what we're doing when we have a, uh, a container image that we want to scan, imagine that image is stored in its image registry going to extract that image and uh, run it in a deployment somewhere and it would be a very good idea that if that image has a, has a vulnerability in it before we deploy it we want to be able to uh, check for that and stop it from running. We also want to know that if a new vulnerability gets uncovered because vulnerabilities can be found, new vulnerabilities might be identified in existing code then we need to know which of our running containers have that vulnerability. So we might have already deployed that container. It's already, we've got containers running with that vulnerability. We need to be able to identify those, stop them and replace them with a new version of the image that doesn't have that vulnerability. So we would typically wanna have a scanning step every time we get an image out of the registry, just make sure that it's, or at least on a regular basis, make sure that that image does not have 
known vulnerabilities. If we find one, we need to replace that container with a version that doesn't have that, that issue. So this vulnerability scanning step, it's going to look inside the container image, find out which software packages are contained in that image, so packages like OpenSSL, look at the version of that package, check whether or not that version of that package has a known vulnerability, and if it does, it will report that vulnerability. And that sounds super easy, right? Because we've got a vulnerability database. We can look inside the container image for these packages. We should just be able to compare the two. So why, why is this a big deal? Why is this hard? We'll talk about that. It all comes down to the fact that there are different distributions that handle different software packages in different ways. So for most of us, we're, we're talking about Linux containers, the Windows containers is a thing, but uh, for most of us, we're really talking about images based on Linux. And those images can use different distributions of Linux. So the Linux kernel is one thing, there are different versions of it, but it's essentially one product that uh, gets released. But there are lots of different distributions built on top of that kernel. So uh, lots of us you know, will have come across these different versions like Ubuntu or Suzy Linux or maybe Amazon Linux if you're using the Amazon uh, you know, EC2 machines. Um, there are many different, I don't know how many, probably dozens of different distributions of Linux out there. And they, they have these different components that they bring together, and they also have different philosophies about how they uh, manage the distribution, and that affects the way that uh, vulnerabilities get found. So, for example, um, here's a selection of a few different Linux uh, distributions. They have different GUIs. Uh, they might have different default shells installed. Importantly for us, they have different uh, default package managers. And the package manager makes a difference to how we handle these uh, vulnerabilities because we're looking for vulnerabilities in software packages installed by these package managers. So it doesn't really matter what all the individual details in this table are. The point is that they distribute different components. And particularly in that last line, we talk about the release model they have different philosophies about how frequently they'll uh, do updates, uh, uh, whether or not they uh, do package updates frequently or wait for a sort of major release at, on a known schedule every three months or every six months. And these container images that we have could be based on different distributions, you know, so it, a lot of us might be running on a host machine that runs one or a set of host machines that run one distribution of Linux, but the container images could be running different distributions. Uh, Alpine is a great example. It's a relatively stripped down distribution. So a lot of container images are based on Alpine. The packages that are installed into those container images are probably using Alpine uh, package management called APK, and they will follow those APK distributions of packages. And those are handled quite differently from the way that, let's say, Debian handles packages and updates to packages. So let's drill down a little bit more into these different approaches to handling software packages. Let's say there is some software package that we're interested in. Maybe we could be talking about OpenSSL that I had in my example before, or we could be talking about uh, what essentially any package that you might install with a package manager. And those packages, they probably come from some source code written by some developers who may have no particular relationship with a particular Linux distribution. Those developers create a, a, a binary distribution. They, they work on that code and they release that code. But there's often going to be a, a version of those packages uh, developed for 
different Linux distributions. I've just noticed that for some reason, my arrow has, there's an arrow that has shifted up on this slide. So there should be an arrow between compiled and packaged and package repository. So the distribution maintainers will uh, take that source code. No, they, they, they might take the binary distribution, but oftentimes they'll take the source code, uh, compile it themselves, package it up in the particular package management for their, um, uh, for their distribution. And uh, they'll store it in a repository. So these different distributions have their own different uh, package repositories. And they may do different things. They may take different choices as they build those uh, packages and put them in their different package repositories. So for example, uh, a distribution, the distribution maintainers might decide to enable or disable particular features in a package. They might decide that they're gonna link with those packages based on certain releases of, of underlying dependency libraries. They might repackage uh, these uh, packages altogether. And then we get into the things that are really important to us from a vulnerability perspective, which is how they handle patches and bug fixes. So, the uh, upstream developers are making changes and fixes to their software. And some set of those changes and fixes will be to fix software vulnerabilities. So if a researcher finds a, a vulnerability, they uh, disclose it to the developers and the developers create a fix to, uh, to patch that, that vulnerability, to basically render that uh, vulnerability non-existent. So somewhere there's a code change or a set of code changes in some software that needs to be built into that package just to, to remove the vulnerability. And the distribution already has a package with the vulnerability and now they have to decide how they're gonna handle that fix. And for example, are they gonna cherry pick just that fix? Are they gonna take a new release of that package? Um, that's kind of up to the distribution maintainers to decide how they're going to handle that. Um, and I just saw a really great question coming in. I've got the, uh, the Slack in front of me and I just saw a question saying, is there any website that announces the new vulnerabilities and their severity? Um, so I will show a, a, shortly about how there are distribution specific websites or sources. And there are also, um, uh, th there is the NVD, so that NVD website, which has updates every time there are new uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, sometimes the NVD and the distributions don't even agree on what the severity is, so that's interesting. So depending on which distribution you're using, the updated version of the package you get with a fix for a vulnerability might be it might be a whole new release or it might be a patch and different distributions might create different patches to address the same vulnerability so for example taking debian they very much focus on stability they they release infrequently and they try to take the minimal amount of change for uh, required to to patch security issues so they as a general philosophy, they, they will, will rarely, if ever, update a package to its latest version, its latest upstream version to address a vulnerability. They would rather just apply the patch, cherry pick the patch for that particular issue. And they might need to do some backporting to uh, apply that fix to older versions that they're still supporting. So, you need to know whether or not your package has that patch in order to know whether it's got that vulnerability. We'll take a, an example here. This is, uh, it doesn't really matter what the vulnerability is here, but, uh, oh, I've gone, skipped too far forward by moving my mouse. All right, there we go. Um, so this particular uh, vulnerability in a varnish HTTP cache package. 
and it exists according to the NVD. It exists in all the versions between. Uh, I think it's actually the NVD will tell us it was between 4.0.0 and 5.2. Um, so I, actually, there's conflicting information on that slide. So I'm I'm doubting myself now. But uh, one of those things is true, either between 4.1 and 5.2 or 4.0 and 5.2. Okay, so that's what the NVD says. That's the, essentially based on the upstream version of the package. But now let's look at what Debian say about the same uh, issue. So this is the, uh, what they would say, the, uh, it's the uh, Debian security advisory about this particular vulnerability. So in the question that came up earlier about uh, the website that announces these new vulnerabilities, this is the distribution specific website for Debian, or it's an extract from. And what it's saying is for the versions of the varnish package that Debian were maintaining at the point that I took this screenshot, they applied patches to each of those versions. So 3.0.2, 4.0.2, and 5.0.0. Um, and you would have expected from the information on the previous slide that uh, 5.0.0 would be a vulnerable version. If all you looked at was the NVD information and you looked at that package version number, you'd probably think it was vulnerable. You have to have come and looked at this uh, distribution information to know that I don't know, if you've got this patch, it's okay. This is a fixed version. So the scanner, your vulnerability scanner, would need to be looking at this information source as well as the NVD if it was scanning a Debian image. Uh, another example is uh, Alpine here. So um, I'm going to. I'm going to have to try and move my mouse to, I have something is obscuring my screen. I need to, okay, apologies for that. Right, and oops, there we go. Right, so this particular um, release of the BusyBox package in Alpine, uh, there's a few, uh, high severity and medium severity vulnerabilities in that particular release, 1.27.2. If you look at the, uh, this is the um, kind of build record, uh, the, the contents of what the Alpine distribution put into BusyBox 1.27.2, and it actually has these patches for the known vulnerabilities applied. So uh, for example, the first on that list is CVE 2017 16544. If I go back and look at the previous one, that's the top one in, in my list. So this vulnerability exists in the base image for 1.27.2, but the Alpine maintainers applied a patch in order to uh, fix that particular vulnerability and the other two on that previous list. What we can also see from this Alpine uh, record of what went into the BusyBox package is another set of patches that for whatever reason, for probably very good reasons, that Alpine maintainers made to that particular package. They could be great, they could be perfect patches, they could be flawless, but there's, there's no way of knowing. And there's no, because those patches are not known to NVD, there's no way for the NVD record to reflect any vulnerabilities that might be in that patch. You'd have to rely on the Alpine maintainers sharing information about any vulnerabilities in that kind of Alpine specific set of patches. And of course, these records are happening for all the thousands of different pa packages that exist you know, in the world and all the different vari variations uh, of those packages for different distributions. So there's a lot of information out there required to do vulnerability scanning. 
And I've just been talking about these package manage these packages that get installed by a system package manager like APT or APK or YUM um, that are uh, specific to the Linux distribution. And for a lot of um, container image scanners, that's that's all they'll scan for. Um, and that's a lot, right? This is where the majority of um, serious software vulnerabilities come through these operating system packages. There are two other places in which software can get sort of installed into your, um, into your container or, or onto the server come to that. Uh, language specific or application package managers. So for example, for Node, if you're writing in Node, you might be installing dependencies with NPM. If you're writing in Python, you might be installing dependencies using pip. And there can be software vulnerabilities in, uh, in those dependencies as well. Any software could have an exploitable flaw in it, theoretically. So some uh, image scanners will also look at security advisories related to these uh, application packages, the programming language specific packages. The third set of uh, ways that uh, software can get into your container is what, what I've called here self-installation. So some other manual way of getting software into, into a container, into a container image or into a server. For example, manually copying files or running make those things much harder to scan certainly won't come under the class of known vulnerabilities. But when we talk about container image scanners, generally speaking, they will cover item one here, so system packages, and sometimes they will also cover application packages, which is item two here. All right, so I think I've, um, oh, we'll talk a little bit more about um, scanners. Uh, so what are we looking for in a scanner? So I got ahead of myself. I thought I was going to show you some actual scan results there. Um, when you're picking an image scanner, there are many of them out there. And uh, as I said before, some of them are open source, some of them are commercial. And uh, I, I wanted to just kind of run through some of the things that you want to look for in, a, in an image scanner. And kind of an obvious thing is that you want it to detect vulnerabilities. And depending on which Linux distributions you're using and which programming languages you're using, you want to make sure you've got support for those in the image scanner that you're using. If your scanner doesn't look at, but let's take Debian as an example, uh, if you're using Debian-based container images, you need to make sure your scanner supports that. I think they all do, but um, maybe if you were using something a bit more esoteric, you know, check that your scanner supports all the base images that you're using. You also want to look for high accuracy. So one of the complaints that people make about uh, vulnerability uh, scanning is that because you get you've got lots and lots of images, and there are lots and lots of packages in those images. And there are lots of potential vulnerabilities in all of those packages. You can end up with a giant set of results and it can be hard to manage. It can be hard to understand whether some of those are false positives. Um, it, it can be a, a bit of a flood of information. So you really want to have accurate scanning, uh, make sure that it is pulling uh, data from the, from the relevant uh, security advisories. Uh, sometimes upstream software vendors will also have security advisories. Uh, there are lots of different sources and generally speaking, the more sources, the more accurate and the less likely you are to have these false positives. You might also want to be looking for uh, automating this process. Well, you, I, I hope you will be looking to automate this process. So you want tools that you can embed, that integrate with the other systems, other parts of the system you're using. So for example, whatever CI CD pipeline you're using, uh, you might wanna scan the images in your 
uh, image registry automatically. And there are, the different scanners will have different integrations with different tools. A uh, couple of things I wanted to, to just highlight here. When you're running a CICD pipeline, something like Travis, for example, as a general rule, you get a new instance of probably a container, possibly a virtual machine, probably a container, to run your, your build and your tests within. And you get that new instance every time. Some of them support caching, others don't. Uh, a lot of scanners have some kind of vulnerability database information that they will download. So you're either going to download a database locally or you're going to check a database uh, in some kind of client server model because you've got to check against all that data about all those vulnerabilities. If it's a local database, if, if the database is pulled locally, you want that database to be small because otherwise every time you run CICD pipeline, if it doesn't have caching, it's got to pull that whole database again. So some uh, tools will have like an optimized version of the um, database so that you can, uh, so that it's fast to download basically in CICD. Some pipelines do have the ability to cache some information so you can keep that, uh, that database kind of cached but updated. Another interesting point is whether your uh, scanner relies on having something like Docker present to pull the image for you or whether it can pull the image uh, by itself. This is kind of a, a almost a, a sort of preference thing, really. It's quite nice to have a scanner that you can run standalone without a dependency on other on having Docker installed or having uh, other tools like Scopio installed. Um, having tools that are easy to install and use, I think we'd all rather to use tools that are easy to install and use. And then the, the last set of things is additional features. Um, now, some of these things, so for example, malware, the feeds, the, the data feeds that a scanner would use to identify malware, I think that the most, if not all, are commercial. So you're unlikely to see malware scanning uh, in many uh, free to use tools because somebody's got to pay for that data source. Um, other functionality that you might see in some scanners is the ability to scan for sensitive data like passwords and tokens, or the ability to scan Windows containers as well as um, Linux containers. Um, I just saw another a couple of actually good questions here, which is basically how can you check these, these things, these characteristics of different scanners? Um, I think one is like read the documentation. If you know that you're using particular programming languages or particular Linux distributions, you know, look in the documentation for support for those scanners. Some scanners will publish what different sources they're using or, or what um, distributions they support. And another great question is, is it worthwhile using multiple scanners? Really great question because at one level, yes, because you're going to be more likely to identify uh, vulnerabilities. You're less likely to, it, it's always possible that a vulnerability scanner will miss some vulnerabilities. The downside is you're going to have to figure out which set of results is correct. And correct turns out to be really hard like when I first started in software I thought that you know software things were generally you know they worked or they didn't work things are fixed or they're broken it turns out there's a whole gray area with vulnerabilities so for example uh the NVD may say that a particular vulnerability uh, yeah a particular vulnerability is high severity classified it that way and a particular distribution might say because of some mitigating factor, because of some other characteristic of their system, it's not so severe on their platform. So I think as a general rule, I would tend to say the distribution is probably correct. They, you know, they, they take these things seriously. They, they, they want to have the correct assessment of vulnerabilities. 
but you know philosophically you can go well do i take the most severe result or do i take the distribution results it, it's it's kind of a f philosophical choice um you do also get this knowledge of um, which version got the patch applied um so some uh uh sometimes the version numbering is not as consistent as you would hope so sometimes packages get released you know not in semantic version ordering correctly and then you have this problem of whether or not uh, a version is vulnerable or not and you can't necessarily just do a sort of mathematical check on the version number um, using multiple scanners i think I would hope that most scanners, if they are pulling from the correct sources, uh, would be um, would be pretty accurate. Pretty, uh, they would pretty much agree on the really important, like critical, high severity vulnerabilities. It would be an interesting test to compare the two. Um, oh, one other interesting sort of anecdote, I suppose, about these different sources, um, Alpine. The Alpine Linux distribution a few months ago changed the way they're publishing their security advisories. And I know because I, I my company works or uh, produces this open source tool called Trivi. Um, you know, we updated it to use the new source, but we know that there are some other scanners who have not updated to use the new source yet. And so they're the data is you know now several months out of date uh, so it's kind of a, a an interesting test i would definitely say try testing for some more recent vulnerabilities and see whether you get the right results uh, i'll come back to that question later actually i think there's one last question come up Okay, so I wanted to do a, a quick demo. I'm actually just gonna use a screenshot just to sort of um, uh, save a bit of time here. Um, so Trivi, which I, I just mentioned, and this is uh, the open source tool that, that I, or my team and I work on called Trivi. And we do try to make it really easy to install and use. So you can install it using things like Homebrew if you wanna put it on your Mac. Uh, we have installations for a lot of the um, major package managers. So you can just install it from you know, using yum or APT, or whatever your package manager of choice is. And basically you just run Trivi and the name of your image and that's all you need to do. Some scanners will require you to install a variety of different components. We tried to make it as simple as possible. And this is an example of some results. So here I, I actually took this earlier, as you can see uh, earlier today, you can see from the timestamp, uh, I ran Trivi against an old version of Alpine that I knew even in that base image, it has some known vulnerabilities in the, the, some of the packages installed. And you can see uh, the kind of information you're looking for from a scanner. So. First of all, how many uh, issues there are and what severity they are. So you might choose to have a very simple rule that says, if this has any high severity or, or critical uh, vulnerabilities, I don't wanna deploy it. Or you might have more sophisticated rules that say, well, in general, I don't want to uh, deploy any high severity vulnerabilities, but perhaps I've got like some whitelisted ones that I know I'm going to have to live with for some period of time. Um, but generally speaking, as a rule of thumb, not deploying any high or critical severity vulnerabilities would be a really good sort of baseline policy. So if you saw a result like this, you would not want to deploy this image and you would not want to deploy an image based on this version of Alpine. Uh, another thing to point out is it, it's showing you what version is installed into this image and uh, it's showing you what version needs to be installed in order to get the, uh, well, to remove the vulnerability. 
I'm running the same thing over Alpine latest. Uh, now I left in this uh, warning. So scanning using the latest tag is a little bit of a, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because it's a little bit of a detour, but that latest tag changes, right? Every time you uh, rebuild a new version of the image and push it and make it the latest version, it, it means that somebody else is, well, you can't rely on Alpine latest, meaning a particular version of Alpine. And in the context of a scanner, if we're caching the results, which we do in the case of Trivi, um, if you cache those results for some amount of time, it doesn't necessarily know that the tag has changed. So if I were to rerun that Trivi Alpine latest command, it would go, well, here's, here's the results I had from before, without necessarily knowing that the, the latest version was actually a, a different, uh, it might have been changed in the meantime. But the good news here is that in this latest version, 3.11.3 .3 of today, there are no vulnerabilities, which is pretty awesome. So I wanted to just wrap up a little bit by talking about, about incorporating scanning into your pipelines, into your workflows. I mean, this is DevSecOps, right? You want to automate this. You don't want to be running it day in, day out on your command line. That would be really dull. So you can do that. You can be running these scans on your developer laptop. You do want to be incorporating this into your um, automated build, into your CI process somehow. And you might, for example, uh, fail the build if you find a high severity vulnerability so that the developer can straight away update you know, the versions that they're using in the, in the build so that rebuild it with up-to-date patched versions of all the packages. You might also want to regularly scan the images that exist in your image registry. And this comes back to what I mentioned before about um, researchers finding new vulnerabilities in existing code. So your images sitting in your registry completely unchanged, maybe haven't, maybe some of those images haven't changed for weeks or months, software hasn't changed, but our knowledge of vulnerabilities has changed. So you might now find new vulnerabilities when you rescan. So having scanned, you might, for example, want to scan on a regular basis. You might also want to scan as you pull an image out of the registry. Uh, I mentioned this earlier on and make sure that you don't admit images if they have high severity vulnerabilities. Or you could have more sophisticated admission control rules that look at exactly what's, uh, what's in the report. Okay. So if you want to incorporate something like Trivi into a CI CD pipeline, it's, it's pretty trivial. Uh, it's called Trivi, it's trivial. Um, one of the things that we maybe a little gotcha is that you have to specify, if you want to fail the CI pi pipeline based on particular severity vulnerabilities, you can use this uh, dash dash exit code parameter. So basically saying, uh, for example, in the first example, if uh, you find a high severity or critical severity vulnerability, use the exit code one. And in general, a non-zero exit code would fail a CI tool. Um, and there's a couple of other options that we recommend to basically not show a, a progress bar. If it's downloading the, uh, uh, the database, it would normally show a progress bar, but that would be pointless in a CI automated system uh, and to automatically refresh the, the database. So just a, a few examples to show you know, that it's a, it's a simple thing to add something like Trivi into your pipeline. And, it, you know, this kind of step would also be true for other kinds of scanners. Uh, uh, some scanners are more complex and require additional components. Other scanners are also kind of single line commands that you could integrate 
should you want to. Okay, so I know there's a couple of questions, but I thought I'd just uh, sort of finish up by saying, if you take anything away from this talk, I would like to encourage you to scan your images because if you are running with those high severity vulnerabilities, somebody will find them if, you know, if you're running it on a internet connected application, someone will exploit them if they're high or critical severities. And it's easy to incorporate this into your CICD pipeline. If there's one thing you do to secure your container deployment, well, I mean, you know, aside from doing things like not, I don't know, putting your admin dashboard on, on the internet or something, but in, in general, this is really easy to do. It's a huge bang per buck for containerized deployment. So I really encourage you to add a scanner into your pipeline. Okay, I think there were also a couple of questions and I've slightly lost track. So Sam, maybe you can help me find which questions. Perfect, of course I can. Well, <laughs> um, we had one actually specific to Trivi about databases um, and which ones you guys were scanning. But let me also make sure that we don't um, leave out. So we had someone asking about how vulnerability scanners um, help in scanning third party libraries, which are not part of the base Docker image. Right, yes. And I may have, uh, because I used uh, an Alpine base image that may have been slightly confusing. So yeah. In a container image, you have you start with the base image and uh, you can think of it as a layer. And then your Docker file, as you, as you build the image based on a Docker file, each instruction in that Docker file adds a new layer. So your container image actually comes delivered to you when you, when you pull it out of the registry. It has these separate layers and then they get unpacked and merged into the image that you actually run. So there's some really interesting things happening. So the, first of all, you can think about, do you just scan the combined image, the thing that you're gonna run um, you know, wh when you unpack that image, that's the set of software you're gonna run, or do you also wanna scan the individual layers? One of the reasons why that's quite interesting is because one layer can add a vulnerability and another subsequent layer can take it away again. Um, so for example, you could have a, a layer that runs, uh, let's say, uh, app get install some image and maybe that, uh, so, sorry, some package and maybe that package has a vulnerability in it. You could have a, another command later that does app get install or app get update to install a newer version of the same package. So the result is an image that doesn't have that vulnerability, but if you look at the individual layers, it does. And you might want to, um, uh, you might want to remove those in, in older layers, kind of partly out of um, just being on the safe side and partly because, um, well, particularly if we were thinking about things like sensitive data, things like passwords, although they're not in the container image as it gets run, you could inspect those individual layers and find that sensitive data. Okay, I hope that, so, and how does a vulnerability scanner help in scanning third libraries which aren't part of the base Docker image? I think they should all be looking at either all the individual layers or the overall sort of unpacked version of, of those, all, all the layers. And what they'll do is they will, you, essentially you've got a file system and it will look to see what the package manager in that file system says is installed, what packages are installed typically. Perfect, sounds good. I think all the other questions that came through, you kind of either answered or alluded to in your actual um, session. Um, so, um, I think that is a wrap, but if anyone does have any further questions, please feel free to um, obviously jump into the Slack community. Um, Liz is a member there um, and she'll be able to answer your questions. And obviously we have abundance of knowledge within that community. Um, and so um, if Liz is not available, there's obviously a lot of people to, to drive the discussion and, and assist. So if you're watching this post live session, um, your questions can always be answered in there. 
um, kind of living, breathing content. But again, thank you so much. I was really excited to have you on the show and our first sort of coronavirus episode. Um, <laughs> I, I, I didn't even mention it. <laughs> Uh, a few people have asked me um, if I've been affected and I said well I've always been virtual so it works really well um, but I hope everyone has enjoyed that um, again uh, it'll be live on the website in a few minutes um, as well as on YouTube and our next session if not soon will be on the 2nd of April really looking forward to that one um, but again if you enjoyed it please share tell your friends um, your families your loved ones your pets enjoyed it too um, and again thank you so much Liz but that is a wrap thank you for having me and bye everyone stay safe